Episode 74, Everyone Hates Vigilius. Thank you for listening to the History of the Papacy, an Agora Podcast Network member. We are on Facebook and Twitter, and I set up a Facebook group called A2Z History Page. You can find links in the show notes and on the website a2zhistorypage.com. You can also send me a good old-fashioned email to steve at a2zhistorypage.com, and there is always the History of the Papacy Amazon wish list if you are looking to add just one more item into your Amazon cart. We have a new member added to the History of the Papacy diptychs list at the Alexandria level, Roberto. Roberto has asked some really interesting and thought-provoking questions. I can't wait to answer them, and I'm very happy, and thank you so much, Roberto, for becoming a supporter of the show on patreon.com forward slash papacy. There's a ton of great rewards. Particularly, you will receive all new episodes completely ad-free on a bonus feed. So if you want to learn more about that, you can go over to patreon.com forward slash papacy or just email me and I'd be happy to explain it further. I'd also like to mention that I will be attending the Saturday session of the Sound of Education podcasting convention on November 3rd at Harvard University in Cambridge, which is next to Boston. I would always just say Boston, but maybe people who live in Cambridge might get angry about that. So I'll just say Cambridge. I will more than likely be speaking on a panel on Saturday as well. If any of you out there are thinking about attending this really cool opportunity, I really hope to meet with you there. So definitely get in touch by email or Facebook, and we'll definitely try and arrange some sort of meetup. There's probably going to be a ton of meetups going on there, so it should be a real blast. There's going to be a ton of podcasters, and I think that it'll be a great time. So if you're thinking about coming, just come and do it. Now, for today's episode, we join the story after the death of Pope Silverius, son of Pope Pors Mizdas. Back then, things like this were much more common. Remember, Silverius was deposed and died under unusual circumstances in 537. Belisarius had Silverius arrested and removed from his bishopric. A rival with imperial backing was made Pope. All this happened in the backdrop of the Gothic Wars. Gothic and Byzantine armies crisscrossed Italy, leaving destruction in their wake. Rome was besieged on several occasions by the Goths and the Byzantines. All of this conflict left the door open for other groups, such as the Lombards and eventually the Franks, to make their way into Italy too, and a lot of extra destruction on that front as well. And all these armies didn't bring stability either. This was not a happy time to have lived, especially in the Italian peninsula. Let's leave 537 for the moment and skip forward to the Year of Our Lord, a dating convention which was gathering popularity at this time, 555. I want you to picture a broken man, physically and mentally. He's old and he looks well beyond his years. And he's sitting on a beach in a sun-drenched island of Sicily. This old man looks over the water and wonders what has happened in the past almost decade. How did a pope who looked like he could probably mend the problems of East and West and potentially bring them together, bring together this monophysite and the Chalcedonian groups in 537 found that the bishops and his own patriarchy, including North Africa and Milan, had broken off communion with him, and bishops of the East had completely abandoned him as well, and chased him off in shame. So that gives us a good start. Let's start where Vigilius came from. Vigilius started off in a good life, 
His father was a high-ranking magistrate in Rome, and his brother was too. Pope Boniface II reigned in the early 530s and named Vigilius as his successor. Now, popes were not allowed to name successors, and the clergy of Rome did not like that. They forced Boniface to rescind that edict that he had made. No biggie. Boniface's real successor, Agapitus, made Vigilius Apocrisarii, or a papal ambassador, which would eventually become Nuncio. I might even just use Nuncio because Apocrisarii is really hard to say. But anyways, he was made, Vigilius was made ambassador to Constantinople in the mid-500s. Vigilius made many friends in Constantinople, including the Emperor Justinian and Justinian's Empress Theodora. Now remember old Theodora, she was a huge monophysite. Justinian leaned towards Chalcedonian, but with more of a, what you might call a Cyrillian flair. There's some contemporary issues going on here. Theodora tried to butter up Vigilius. She wanted Vigilius to end excommunication of the monophysite patriarch of Constantinople, and Themis pushed a revised version of the hated Hanoticon, so he's not a popular character in the West, to say the least. Sources say that Theodora got a commitment from Vigilius while he was the ambassador of the Pope in Constantinople that he would be pro monophysite Now, whether that's kind of a <laughs> twisting of history, we don't know. Maybe they had some conversations, thought that they could bring things together. Maybe that's the best of circumstances. Or maybe Vigilius did say, if you make me Pope, I'm going to be in the camp for the, the monophysites. We just don't know. It's a who knows, but probably not that much was promised by Vigilius. The Liber Pontificalis paints Vigilius as a big flip-flopper. And maybe he did promise the world to everyone. He wouldn't be the first politician to do such. Word came to Constantinople that Pope Agapetus died. Some of this is going to be overlap with the last main episode, so bear, we'll just, it bears repeating. Vigilius was sent back to Rome with a big bag of gold to spread around to get himself elected. Now, papal elections were different in the 500s, but maybe not that different, really, in a way. Pope Agapetus did die in Constantinople while he was on an embassy from the ruler of the Goths in 536, so Vigilius would have had adva advance notice of there needing to be a new pope. The Byzantines wanted Vigilius elected. The Goths wanted Silver Silverius. The Goths got Silverius elected really quickly. Now, Vigilius hit Rome ready to go to become pope, but... Silverius was already had been elected, and during this time, we're full blown into the Gothic Wars here. Rome, the city, went back and forth between the Byzantine and Gothic control, and just really making a mess of things for the the population. Things being destroyed, starvation, disease, you name it. Now, everyone must have known that Theodora wanted Vigilius on the throne of Peter, not Silverius. A letter was forged saying that Silverius was somehow in cahoots with the Goths during one of these sieges and may have let them into the city. Belisarius arrested Silverius on this charge and sent him off packing dressed as a monk. So basically the Byzantines defrocked Silverius, if you will, and ultimately Silverius would die after he was expelled from Rome. But guess what? For Vigilius, this is a job opening, and Vigilius was elected pope in 537. Vigilius wasn't that bad either as a pope initially. He rebuilt churches destroyed during the Gothic Wars. He organized relief for people, so he was doing the best job he could as a pope. Now let's go back. Let's picture Vigilius sitting on that beach in Sicily. He must have thought things didn't look so bad in 537. Maybe he could fix up a church or two, pass out some alms to the poor, 
do a little pastoral care, you know, maybe get out of this whole um, political morass that was between the Chalcedonians and the Monophysites and the Goths and the Byzantines. Vigilius, and Vigilius was able to do these things for a while. But in the long term, that just was not to be. Events were unfolding in Constantinople. So let's take a look what's going on there. In 543, the Origenist heresy was anathematized with the support of Justinian. We discussed this a bit with Terry Young of the History of the Early Church podcast. Origen of Alexandria, also known as Origen Adamantius, died in the 250s AD. So we're talking a full 300 years earlier. Now, Origen, this Origen, he had some wacky ideas. I mean, let's not mince words here. But he also was really rock solid in his orthodox ideas. If you want to see a message thread explode, say that Origen wasn't so bad. Some people are going to say, we love Origen. Other people are going to say, oh, that Origen, he's such a heretic. Now, this Origenist heresy in the 500s didn't have much to do with Origen himself. Some monks in the 500s had run with some of Origen's ideas and further developed them, further and further and further, and that was really based on some of Origen's maybe more borderline heretical ideas. So they're taking some of the borderline heretical ideas and stretching them even further. And just always keep in the back of your mind, Origen died a martyr in completely inside of the church 300 years before this. Another thing was happening was that in 544, the so-called three chapters were anathematized by Justinian. So what were these three chapters? Some of the part of the three chapters was some of the writing of Theodoret of Cyrus, who died in 447, solidly orthodox. He even at the Council of Chalcedon, he rejected the the most flagrant things that Nestorius was saying. And some of the Monophysites were still against Theodoret, but he was still completely inside of the church as of the Council of Chalcedon in 453. Another one of these three chapters, you kind of think of three chapters like three chapters of a book. It's not like that. It's not like that. It was actually bits and pieces of all these people's writing. And one of the other people's writings was Theodore of Mapasuestia. Actually, Theodore Mapasuestia himself was anathematized and his writings. I mean, this was another one. Theodore of Mapasuestia was praised at the ecumenical councils and died solidly orthodox in 428. Another part of the three chapters was one particular letter of Ebus of Edessa, who wrote to a bishop named Maris. Ebus died in 457. Ebus didn't support Nestorius. He, in fact, anathematized him. Ebus didn't like the way Cyril of Alexandria operated, so it's even beyond just a theological complaint. Ebus did not like the way Cyril of Alexandria was kind of a bully. And that's really all that it took to get on the wrong side of these of the Monophysites at this time. We're talking about another situation where there's polarization. And if somebody's perceived on the other end of the spectrum, then when people have become radicalized like this, that's when somebody who might not necessarily be in that big of disagreement be can become the enemy, and that's really what's happening right now. So all of these things are going on. Let's picture Vigilius again, back at, looking, he's turned himself around, and he's looking towards the farmland of Sicily, just beautiful olives growing, grapes, and he should have known earlier in his career that something was not right coming out of Constantinople. Church leaders who had died completely in the good graces of the church were being excommunicated. People who supported Chalcedonian orthodoxy were being anathematized. Wasn't that the standard of Christianity at that point? The Council of Chalcedon? A theme was starting to develop. A theme Vigilius 
may have seen coming. The Council of Chalcedon was being tempered. One could even say being watered down. What was to stop them from going after the Tome of Leo, maybe making four chapters? Constantinople had to make the Monophysites happy. But did Vigilius? And how was this? Vigilius should have been thinking about what did that do to his base of support in Western Europe? This is all the lead up to the Fifth Ecumenical Council, the Second Council of Constantinople. Let's not go too quickly, though. Why did Justinian want to condemn the three chapters in a, and Origen, especially those three chapters, considering that Justinian thought of himself as a Chalcedonian? Condemning the three chapters was very popular among the Monophysites because Ebus, Theodoret, and Theodora Mapasuestia espoused a two-nature Christology. Also, these three characters, Ebus, Theodoret, and Theodore, were of a different school. They were of the Antiochene school of theology. They had separated themselves, and they were looking more Eastern now instead of looking towards Constantinople and Alexandria. They were taking on a whole different flair. They're, and what we're eventually going to see is that their version or brand of Christianity is going to become very popular in the Persian Empire, and hopefully that's a series that I'll be able to do one day. I have the materials, but it's like everything else. There's, there's a lot to go through and a lot to talk about here as well. I think it just always bears repeating, too, that all three of these guys and their writings were all, for lack of a better word, kosher at the Council of Chalcedon in 451. There was a political pressure to condemn Origen as well because of these Origenist monks, and this was this is all really inside baseball politics that even didn't really have much to do with religion as such in Constantinople. I mean, you want to talk about Byzantine politics, here we go. And for everything, it was really easy to kick Theodore, Theodoret, and Ebus out because their schools had spread into the Persian Empire, which, I mean, how many people in the Eastern Roman Empire were big fans of Persian, the Persian Empire at any point at this time anyways? These, the Nestorians, represented by the Christian church in Persia, didn't really care much what was going on in the Byzantine Empire anymore anyway, so it's just easy target. It was easy to kick out Origen because the Originist monks were pretty heretical. Origen had some strange ideas, but he had been dead for 300 years, so maybe the Originist monks out, but there's less reason to tar Origen himself. So for all of this, there was just a lot of back and forth between the West and the East and all these different theologians. Vigilius himself, he was hesitant to excommunicate these three chapters. If you look at a continuum of two nature to one nature Christologies, Rome was more solidly two nature than Constantinople. Constantinople was much more willing to temper its two-nature Christology with some, some of these Cyrillian Cyril of Alexandria ideas. Vigilius excommunicated the Patriarch of Constantinople. Nothing new here. It certainly happened many times before, but Vigilius was feeling that pressure to that the Patriarch of Constantinople had gone too far. There was a lot of pressure on Vigilius to condemn the three chapters, though, and he finally did, but was insistent that he did not condemn the Council of Chalcedon, even though that was ultimately the aim of the Monophysites. Now, these condemnations of the three chapters were very unpopular in the West, in North Africa, North Italy, and parts of Gaul. Most of the Eastern bishops, with a little cajoling here and there, came to condemn the three chapters. I mean, some condemned them wholeheartedly, and others needed a little bit of arm-twisting. 
But like I said, the condemnation of the three chapters was really unpopular in the West. Western bishops would not condemn them. And it seems that Vigilius was really the only one who was pushing it. As a matter of fact, maybe he pushed it a bit too hard because some bishops of North Africa excommunicated Vigilius. So kind of picture that, a Pope of Rome being excommunicated. Where do we stand with that now? What that did was really sow more bad blood with North Africa. There has always been a lot of bad blood between Rome and North Africa. And that may have helped further weaken the North African church. If you remember to an episode that we did a while back on the North African church, there was vandals who were running the show. They were, in fact, Aryans. You had Catholics, and then you had this Donatist group, who was a splinter group, who were Catholic and everything, but they were much stricter. And they had been separated from the Romans at some time, for some time, and they kind of melded back in and out. But so you're talking in North Africa, a very complicated religious political situation. During all this time, Vigilius and Justinian passed letters to each other, planning on how they could change the mind of the Western bishops. Now, these letters were supposedly secret. Vigilius, because of this, issued something called the Judiacatum. He condemned the three chapters, but specifically did not condemn Pope Leo, which would have made things immensely worse, or the Council of Chalcedon. Justinian worked to depose bishops who would not condemn the three chapters. And then the team of Vigilius and Justin worked on plans to hold a new general or ecumenical council. All this time, Vigilius tried to walk the fence. He went back and forth. But ultimately, in 545, he was arrested or otherwise compelled by Byzantine forces in Rome to leave and shipped back to Constantinople. I mean, you'd have to imagine at this point, Vigilius must have had some idea that the coming general council was not going to go well for him. The cards were all stacked in the East's favor. Italy was in a shambles. The territories of the former Western Roman Empire were ruled by a bunch of barbarians. We can definitely split hairs. They were, I mean, in calling them barbarians, they were a successor kingdom. Rome, as in Constantinople, was really barely holding on there. And they were really just tearing up the place, definitely not making the situation better. In Constantinople, religiously, Justinian and the Easterners were in a very strong position. There wasn't much that the Western bishops could do. And Vigilius just didn't have many options available to him. The general council was called in 553. Vigilius had an extended layover in Sicily of about a year or two. And then Vigilius was in Constantinople for a really long time, like six or seven years. So over the course of that whole time, Vigilius was out of Rome for almost a decade. And he was out of Rome before this council even started for many years. The Liber Pontificalis doesn't really say what was going on during that time either. Vigilius was treated well enough, I would imagine, but he was definitely kept at arm's length. Now, a little bit more background on what Justinian was doing. Justinian did some pretty intense persecutions of Jews, Samaritans, Manichaeans, and what you might call alternative Christianities, such as the Arians and the Montanists, and more. A lot of other different groups that were kind of fading out, but Justinian really put, turned up the heat on them persecution-wise. With this persecution of Justinian, this is the one of the first times that civil liberties, like secular civil liberties, were taken away from other religions. That just was not common up to this point. I haven't used the word religious minority much because it doesn't quite fit in this. I haven't called the Arians minorities, and I haven't called the Montanists minorities, or even the Samaritans or the Jews minorities, because in certain areas... Orthodox Nicene Christianity was very much very likely to be a minority, depending on where you were. It really wasn't about this time 
that Orthodox Nicene Christianity, whether it be Chalcedonian or non-Chalcedonian, was starting to creep up into the 50% range. And in certain areas, other religious groups would have likely been the majority, but they weren't the power structure in all of the areas. In some areas, they actually were. Speak, going back to the civil liberties, this is the point where property rights of other religions were taken away. Sacred buildings were destroyed. Uh, property was taking, taken away from them. They weren't able to access the law as much. This persecution was extreme, too, and even church leaders thought Justinian went too far. So we see here where secular authority is using religion to further secular authority, which is obviously a theme that we're going to see a lot unfold, where religion and secular authority are going to play off of each other, and it's not always going to wind up the best in the end. A tiny bit more by background of what's going on. The Monophysites, or Miaphysites, whatever you want to call them, they were getting it stronger and stronger, and in some cases, more extreme. Some groups of Monophysites in Egypt went as far as getting very close to Apollinarianism, which was the belief that Christ only had one divine nature. His humanity was an accident or an outside mask of his pure divinity really his body was the vessel which hold held the divine nature the vessel is not the most important part it's what's in there a bishop named jacob baradeus was rising to fortune and formed a parallel church structure in the middle east around this time as well and after the fifth ecumenical council Eventually, these churches that he would found, he was going around and naming bishops and ordaining bishops here and there. And eventually, this church that he founded would become the Oriental Orthodox, non-Chalcedonian, Syriac, Jacobite Orthodox Church, which there's still quite a few of them in the Middle East to this day. And I wish I could talk much more about this, and I'd possibly... We'll talk about it in a sidetrack episode, especially if you're interested in it. Definitely let me know through the email or Facebook if that's something you're interested in, because I'll do that probably sooner rather than later. The North African Chalcedonian bishops were totally against any compromise with the non-Chalcedonian bishops. So there again, we see this radicalization. The bishops of North Africa didn't really have any reason to go ahead and compromise with the bishops of Egypt and vice versa. So that's just how that was going to play out. This is a time in history where monks of different religious factions and, I mean, really, when you go down to it, slightly different Christologies were battling each other in the street. And... This played in much more into the political situation in the East, where you had more of a mixture of Chalcedonians and non-Chalcedonians. I mean, when you get just down to it, the two sides were not that that radically far apart, unless you got into maybe Nestorian versus a person who is getting into that on the opposite side of the spectrum of Apollinarian, then you are talking about a pretty sizable difference. But otherwise, between a Chalcedonian and a non-Chalcedonian, with a little bit of work, they probably could have patched things together. Groups were trying, and theologians were trying to get each other, get each other together and make, make these two sides fit together. One idea was the idea of an hypostaton, which was where two natures come together to make one hypostasis. Again, you're getting into some pretty heavy-duty Greek and Platonic theory here and philosophy, which they were in a way defining as they moved along here. So it's it's getting complicated. And then there was plenty of room for them to come together, or there was also plenty of room for people to drive a wedge as well. These terms were all being refined and redefined, forming and unforming to come together. Remember, in the 270s, the term hypostasis was considered a heresy. By 325, hypostasis was 
what orthodoxy used to describe their a basic fundamental of their religion. With all that, finally, in 553, the council begins. It's convened. Justinian gave a great summary of the events leading up to the council. Uh, I'm going to read a little bit of a quote from Justinian's opening address, which very well may have been read to the council. I've got this from the New Advent's Early Church Fathers page, which is very easy to uh, search on your Google or whatever you choose as your search engine. But I'm going to read a bit of it here. It's a bit long, but I think it is worth sharing. Quote, The The effort effort of my my predecessors, predecessors, the Orthodox Orthodox emperors, ever aimed aimed at the the settling of controversies which had arisen respecting the faith by the calling of synods. For this this cause, Constantine Constantine assembled 318 fathers at Nicaea, and and was himself present present at the council, and and assisted those who confessed the Son to be consubstantial with the Father. Theodosius, 150 at Constantinople, Theodosius the Younger, the Synod of Ephesus, the Emperor Marcion, the bishops at Chalcedon, as, however, as Marcion's death, controversies respecting the Synod of Chalcedon have broken out in several places. The Emperor Leo wrote to all bishops of all places in order that everyone might declare his opinion in writing with regard to this holy council. Soon afterwards, however, had arisen again the adherents of Nestorius and Eutyches, and caused great divisions, so that many churches had broken off communion with one another. When now the grace of God raised us to the throne, we regarded it as our chief business to unite the churches again, and to bring the Synod of Chalcedon together with the three earlier to universal acceptance. We have won many who previously opposed that synod. Others who preserved their opposition were banished and so restored the unity of the church again. But the Nestorians want to impose their heresy upon the church, and as they could not use Nestorius for that purpose, they made haste to introduce their errors through Theodore of Mapasuestra, the teacher of Nestorius, who taught still more grievous blasphemies than his. He maintained, for example, that God the Word was one and Christ another. For the same purpose, they made use of those impious writings of Theodoret, who were directed against the first synod of Ephesus, against Cyril and his twelve chapters, and also the shameful letter which Ebas is said to have written. They maintain that this letter was accepted by the Synod of Chalcedon, and so would free from condemnation Nestorius and Theodore, who were condemned in the letter. If they were to succeed, the Logos could no longer be said to be made man, nor Mary called the Mother of God. We, therefore, following the Holy Fathers, have first asked you in writing to give your judgment on the three impious chapters named. And you have answered, and have joyfully confessed the true faith, because, however, after the condemnation proceeding from you, there are still some who defend the three chapters. Therefore we have summoned you to the capital, that you may here in common assembly place again your view in the light of day, when, for example, Vigilius, Pope of old Rome, came hither, he, in answer to our questions, repeatedly anathematized in writing the three chapters, and confirmed his steadfastness in his view by much, even by the condemnation of his deacons, Rusticus and Sebastian. We possess still his declarations in his own hand. Then he issued his Judicatum, in which he anathematized the three chapters. You know that he not only deposed Rusticus and Sebastian because they defended the three chapters, but also wrote to Valentinian, bishop of Scythia, and Aurelian, bishop of Arles, that nothing might be undertaken against the Judiacatum. When you afterwards came hither at my invitation, letters were exchanged between you and Vigilius in order to common assembly. 
But now he had altered his view, would no longer have a synod, but required that only the three patriarchs and one other bishop, in communion with the Pope and the three bishops about him, should decide the matter. In vain, we sent several commands to him to take part in the synod. He rejected our two proposals, either to call a tribunal for decision or to hold a smaller assembly at which besides him and his three bishops, every other patriarch should have place and voice with from three to five bishops of his diocese. We further declare that we hold fast to decrees of the four councils and in every way follow the Holy Fathers Anastasius, Hilary, Basil, Gregory the Theologian, Gregory of Nyssa, Ambrose, Theophilus, John Chrysostom, of Constantinople, Cyril, Augustine, Proclus, Leo, and their writings on the true faith. As, however, the heretics are resolved to defend Theodore Maposuestia and Nestorius with their impieties and maintain that the letter of Ebas was received by the Synod of Chalcedon, so do we exhort you to direct your attention to the impious writings of Theodore and especially to his Jewish creed which was brought forward at Ephesus and Chalcedon and anathematized by each synod with those who had so held or did so hold, and we further exhort you to consider what the Holy Fathers had written concerning him and his blasphemies, as well as what our predecessors had promulgated, as also what the church historians have set forth concerning him. You will then see that he and his heresies have since been condemned and that therefore his name has long since been struck from the diptychs of the Church of Mapasuestia. Consider the absurd assertion that heretics ought not be anathematized after their deaths, and we exhort you to further to follow this matter, the doctrine of the Holy Fathers who condemned not only living heretics but also anathematized after their deaths those who had died in their iniquity. Just as those who had been unjustly condemned, they restored after their death and wrote their names in the sacred diptychs, which took place in the case of John and of Flavian of pious memory, both of them bishops of Constantinople. Moreover, we exhort you to examine the writings of Theodoret and the supposed letter of Ebus, in which the incarnation of the word is denied. The expression Mother of God and the Holy Synod of Ephesus rejected. Cyril called a heretic. Theodore and Nestorius defended and praised. And as they say that the Council of Chalcedon has received this letter, you must compare the declarations of this council relating to the faith with the contents of the impious letter. Finally, we entreat you to accelerate the matter. I mean, what can you say? Justinian really laid out the facts of the situation well. Even though Vigilius was in Constantinople, as you uh, heard in the letter, he did not attend. Initially, he was given all these excuses why he couldn't attend. I'm too sick. There weren't enough Italian or Western bishops. Despite all that, Justinian and the Eastern bishops, they kept pushing forward. These Eastern bishops and Justinian pushed their agenda. They officially condemned the three chapters. They condemned the Origenist heresy and Origen. Vigilius tried to fight back, but that just didn't work. Justinian tried to have Vigilius arrested. Vigilius and his party fought back and fled to the church where the Council of Chalcedon was held back in 451. I'm thinking that the choice of the church in Chalcedon as a refuge probably did have a propaganda value. You feel like Chalcedon's getting thrown under the Council of Chalcedon, that is, is getting thrown under the bus. You're about to get arrested. You go to seek sanctuary. Let's go seek sanctuary where... The Council of Chalcedon happened. Make Justinian come in there and arrest me in that church. That has a that has a big value to it, a marketing value, if you will. Justinian here showed how he was the bigger and the better politician. He did what we might call in our modern day a document dump on Vigilius. Justinian released all of the secret communications and letters between Vigilius and himself 
what you might call the Dark Ages or medieval version of WikiLeaks, or a live mic moment. <laughs> Obviously, Vigilius was very embarrassed. These just were things that were not meant for public consumption. In the end, he just had to cave in on all the anathemas of the three chapters, the originists, origin, you name it, and all the pronouncements of the council. A few months later, Vigilius was allowed to return to Italy. Everything had settled out. Vigilius assented to what was done at the council, and that was that. And so here, this is where we join Vigilius sitting back on that beach in Sicily. He just must, he had to have wondered how this house of cards fell all around him. From what we saw happen, it isn't, it isn't that big of a surprise to us with hindsight how the, how there was such a big potential for this whole plan of what Vigilius had to strengthen Rome was, could very well fall apart. Vigilius died in Sicily. He never made it back to Rome. I mean, I'm thinking for Vigilius dying in Sicily was probably the best outcome. He was made a fool of in Constantinople. He didn't push the Roman, Latin, Western agenda any further. The rift between East and West just got a lot bigger. In modern day, the East often blames the split between the Eastern and the Western Church all on the West. But you can see from this point, the West has some complaints against the east there's a wedge was being driven between the western roman catholic latin church and a greek-based constantinople church and it was really a political wedge that was being driven not the least of which also you have to add in there that the gothic wars wouldn't have happened had justinian not went and tried to conquer italy again and Italy was devastated by that war. Now, we're just going to leave Vigilius sitting on that beach. I feel sad leaving him there. He's looking northward to Rome. What could have been is what he must have been thinking, and what went wrong? I wonder if Vigilius knew he would never see Rome again. Maybe he was happy for that, that he didn't have to face the music. We'll never know, but I'd really love to get the chance to get inside of his head and know what he was thinking. Over to patreon.com forward slash papacy to find out more about the great benefits to becoming a patron of the History of the Papacy podcast. Now for the History of the Papacy Patreon diptychs. A huge shout out goes to our Rome level patron, Peter the Great. I want to thank our Constantinople level patrons on patreon.com forward slash papacy, Sandy, Andy, Paul, Dr. Jeff, Robert, Sean, Yorin, Molly, Mary Carmen, and Dapo as well as our Alexandria-level patrons, Francine, Richard, Justin, Rupert, and Roberto. You'll find on patreon.com forward slash papacy all of the many benefits. One of my favorites, and I love doing this, is the for Constantinople and Rome-level patrons, the monthly book drawing. I give away a lot of great books there, and I think you'll enjoy it, the books. I hope you'll enjoy the books, but it's a really fun way to share a lot of the sources that I've used making these podcasts, so I hope you at least check it out. And I, for everybody, even if you aren't on Patreon, I thank you so much for listening. I appreciate you taking your time out of your busy schedule and your all the other options you have out there of podcasts to listen to that you're choosing the history of the papacy. So I very much thank you. And I look forward to seeing you on our next stop on our trip through the history of the Popes of Rome and Christian Church.